today we're going to talk about essentially how we're going to utilize our conversations more effectively when we're working with kids from a distance on like a Zoom or digital platform. Uh, it's it's funny because without the luxury of the, the this physical structure of school and the schoolhouse, all of a sudden our interactions with our kids mean a lot more because they're probably happening less frequently. People aren't coming and going. So when we do get a hold of them for uh, folks who work in alternative ed, getting a hold of kids during uh, distance learning has been part of the challenge. So when we do get a hold of them, we have to make sure that our interactions with them are meaningful in the moment. And I really want to kind of go over that, some individual interaction ideas, some conversational frameworks that can really help sort of transform our interactions with kids, increase their motivation, um, and help us respond to some resistance when they're sort of seeming unwilling to engage. And then I want to kind of talk about some group related stuff that we can do with our kids on a Zoom platform that are kind of, that's kind of fun, lighthearted and engaging as well. So we'll do two different things. I'm going to share my screen and in that uh, there's like a detailed schedule thing. I put a ton of links in there. Um, so you can kind of just, you might need to like request permission and I'll just give that to you. If you don't, then just feel free to look at whatever you want to look at. It should kind of align with uh, what we're going to be doing. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, you can see that I probably need to get that organized at some point. And then, here we go. And let's see here. Uh, can you see that? Oh, that's a good start. We're doing well this morning. All right, cool. So connection before correction, increase in engagement and motivation. The first couple slides, um, will be more informational. And then I kind of like to ditch that and then kind of get to the talking and the fun stuff. Um, there'll be a time where we'll just all unmute because we don't have 50 or so people. And we'll just be able to kind of talk freely. And you don't have to, obviously, but if you want to, go ahead. All right. Goals and objectives for today, I kind of went over these. You can just take a look at them. That's sort of what we're going to try to do in 45 minutes, which will be a tall task. And We'll see if we can do it. Mainly, we're gonna focus on this conversational framework that I'm gonna bring up. And we're gonna kind of think about the way we're using restorative circles and sort of um, blend that into the, the distance learning context. Here's the informational side. Um, some of you may have been to some restorative practices, trainings and stuff like that. That's a, a lot of what I do during the years. I help kind of schools implement restorative practices. Today, we're gonna to be blending restorative practices with motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing comes from the mental health and drug and alcohol fields, and it's very new to education, but it is a conversational approach that focuses on the language of change and accurate, accurately responds to resistance. Um, it's sort of a practical application for interaction, which is important. And then here's the restorative practices theory on top. We're not going to really get too much into the restorative practices and restorative justice side of things. That's a long winded uh, training. So this is what we're going to start practicing with quickly. It's called ORS. It is the basic conversation flow that will take our interactions with our students to the next level individually and in a group context. And it, it's a muscle that we have to exercise. So we're going to want to um, practice it. Open-ended questions or evocative questions are questions that evoke and generate conversation. And as adults, when we're talking with our students, they set up our listening. They're questions that show curiosity, um, that show interest in the student's response and allow us to get in a position as a listener. Um, affirmations are really simple statements. They show empathy. We're gonna practice those. Reflections are the most important part of our conversations. Reflective listening, um, it's more than just repeating back what is said, it also guides the conversation in a direction. And summarizing, we wanna actually incorporate some summaries into our interaction with kids and especially parents. If we have a conversation with parents that lasts five to 10 minutes at the end of it, it's really good to say, hey, is it okay if I take you know, 15 to 20 seconds to sort of summarize our conversation? And then once you go over that paraphrase or summarize it, summer or summary, you say to them, did I get it all? 
and that allows them to fill in any gaps. So we're constantly in that person-centered conversational framework. When we talk about equity, that's really what levels the playing field if we can get there with the way that we interact with kids. Um, I, I'm like doing this, I realized I didn't even say anything about myself. I'm like a ra random dude just talking about stuff. That's kind of, I like that, now I have to backtrack. Uh, I should do that before we start. I, I work at the County Office of Education um, and I do a bunch of stuff mainly with alternative education. I do a lot of the professional development for alt ed staff. And I do some work with other county social service folks around this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I work directly with kids up at juvenile hall on Wednesdays teaching like an SEL type of thing. Um, and I also work directly with kids in different parts of the county with parents and with teachers and helping them out uh, with the conversation stuff. I help out a couple of schools at Hollister as an independent consultant with them with restorative practices implementation. And that's just sort of how it goes. That's what I went and did my graduate school in which restorative practices, which doesn't really give you anything. So you have to kind of carve out a life for yourself and sort of that's what I'm doing. But um, that's a little bit about myself and we'll get back to this. So open versus closed ended questions. Close, closed ended as a typo. Um, Take a look at this screen. These are all real life in ex examples from this year that I heard while I was present working at schools. So you can see the topics here. These might not be totally applicable uh, to distance learning, but it highlights the difference between approaches when we ask. So here's a topic, attendance. Don't you know that if you keep missing school, your family will get into trouble? I've heard some iteration of that question from administrators to students several times over the last few years. It's rhetorical and it puts the kid in a position where they don't really have much to say in response. They can defend themselves or give a short answer. So when you ask that, you fall into what's called a question answer trap. It becomes more investigative and less interpersonal. So if you wanna open that up more, just say, say something like, if you started showing up some more, how would that help out your family? So that's a discrepancy related question that allows the students some wiggle room to operate. And as they respond with their words, it will lead them to some insight and possible change. Um, we won't go over all of these. I, will, I, I underline the one at the bottom because this is one question I've been sort of encouraging teachers to ask when they first get together with their students for that first kind of meaningful interaction. One thing I've learned, and I don't know if this is the same, feel free to put it in the chat or whatever, do whatever you want with the chat as we go, I probably should, yeah. Um, but if, if you've noticed that during distance learning, kids have a lot of other things going on, um, this question helps when, when that's the case. Sometimes parents are back to work, they're babysitting their younger siblings. Um, sometimes they're juggling motivational issues. They have a lot of time to play video games. Their parents aren't there. There's less supervision or their parents are there all day and there's tension around their house and they're feeling their parents' stress and all that kind of stuff. And all that stuff interferes with the learning experience. So this question at the bottom really affirms that and also allows them to sort of dictate where they're at. And that's considering all of the other things you got going on right now in your life. Where, if anywhere, do academics fit in? It's a tough question sometimes for teachers to ask because it's hard to imagine that school might not fit into the equation. But if you allow the student to talk openly about it, you'll likely guide the conversation in the direction where you can set up an academic plan. So that's a good open-ended question. Wait, oh, I got nervous there. Like I thought I messed up my whole presentation. Affirmations, um, actually we're gonna come back to this. I don't know why I put it there. So. Let's, let's stick with this. I wanna give you um, maybe a couple minutes. Look over this screen. Um, you can either write it down, think about it out loud, whatever you wanna do. Choose one of these. These are all three, these are five close-ended questions that I've heard in the last you know, six to eight months. Take a look at these and try to open them up a little bit more. So you're gonna take this close-ended question and transform it into an open-ended question. Let me see if there's, where are the, I gotta figure out where. I'll give you like a kind of 30 seconds to choose your selection and then I'm gonna give a couple open-ended question starters. So I'm gonna see.
there's a there's a link in the um in the scheduled section that has a, a form that's called MI binder and that will have a bunch of different open-ended question starters but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share them out loud just so, just to give you some idea of how how when we ask evocative questions how they sound some of the evocative question starters that really help are like asking what are some reasons for doing this so like what are some reasons for making a change in your life um, if you were to start doing this how would that do so the if and then question framework is really cool is really helpful um, what's getting in the way of you having success what when in the past have you been able to overcome obstacles what happened for you back then sort of revisiting past success and trying to bring it back into the equation um, those are good open-ended question starters If you were to start doing this, how would that help out your family? Um, what would it mean for you to start having success in this area? So th those are on a scale of one to 10, scale questions are really good. Is question number one not open-ended because it assumes that uh, the student like wants some support and must have it? Yeah, that, that that's, a, that's a kind of a good way to think about it, Tim. You know, I don't, it's not that it's not open-ended. I almost think that it's so open-ended that it's almost close-ended, if that makes any sense. I, it's a question I hear so much, and it be, it's so open-ended that it's kind of vague, and it tends to be that parents and students don't know how to answer it. It's asked with the best intentions. A lot of the time, admin and teachers use it because they really care, but most of the time, in my experience, which is a lot of hearing this question, the kid or the parent say, I don't know, or I got it, or I don't know, not, it sort of creates some like uncertainty because it's hard to know for them where to start. That's not always the case. So it's not always closed ended. Sometimes asking it might be good. It's just, that's why I think it is. I noticed too, especially with younger students, like the more like vague a question is the less likely they are to engage because it just like opens a vacuum for them and they're like I, I don't like I don't like they don't even know what support would look like exactly so they like don't have an like an answer pool to pull from um, that's it that, yeah that's a great thing and sometimes what you said like there the other way of asking that is like hey what does support look like the the look like the look like question is tough too because people don't know how to answer that really well, either so evocative questions are kind of nuanced and they're difficult and they require practice. But when we when we start getting ourselves in 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 the place where we're using more of these questions, we're going to notice that our conversations um, are deeper and, and more impactful. All right, so let's talk. So uh, and and we'll just do this together. So who's 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 taken one of these and transformed them? Feel free to unmute yourself and just share out loud. Yeah, yeah I got number one because we were on that already. Um, I was just thinking about um, asking what frustrates you with distance learning, like what, what problems or like what's, what are you having problems with? What's, what's getting on your nerves? It's great. Yeah. And yeah. And, and, and Kyle, even to open that up just a little bit more, I always like even saying like, if anything, what if anything is uh, getting in the way or what if anything, uh, causes problems with this whole distance learning thing. That's a great exercise to start your class with. If you got 10 kids logged into Zoom at the same time, have them make some bullet points, and then you can just chalk it up on like on the whiteboard and just have a big old with all the problems lumped in there and have a have a laugh together and then sort of navigate how you're going to help each other in that space, you know, do a little diet pair share and then come back and report out. So that's a good, good job. Excellent. Who else has got something? I have the other version of that as like, what does success look like for you during distance learning or like what works during distance learning? So like sure. doing both could be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Or even saying like, what, if it, what worked during spring, did any, yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, what will work for you moving forward? Do you have any idea? What else we got? I, I was thinking of, the importance of maybe framing it as um, something that is uh, uh, not just kind of negative. So what are 
two things that have been really working for you? Like, what do you like about it? And what are two things that, um, that you're struggling with? So have that balance. Uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's a, that's a good way of, um, and you might find out that nothing's working and that's okay. And then you can, you know, one, one of the things that's really good to do when we, when we start being more conversational from a distance is really diving into that what's not working piece and giving some space for it, you know, so uh, it's, it's called, uh, it's called siding with the negative. Sometimes we're afraid to do that, but adolescents love it, you know, so it's, it's okay to, to get into that space with them for a little bit. Um, did anybody t uh, look at any of the different questions here and then sort of. Well, I was, I was uh, looking at the, why haven't you been logging into distance learning? Excellent. And jumping on what the gentleman just said about positive versus negative. I was curious if that hat, if it, if you shared something personal of what's frustrating you, like, wow, staff meetings just drive me crazy because I'm tired of seeing the bobbing heads or, you know, whatever it is that you say, is that, I, I'm just curious, does that open it up to especially middle schoolers to talk more or does that sort of shut it down? It's a great question, Cynthia. And I don't, it, I don't have like a fixed answer for you. I, you know, from my experience, I think one, when we, when we attempt to relate to younger people, it can be really powerful, but it also has to be timely, if that makes any sense. So it has to kind of be within the flow of the conversation. I've also seen it kind of drum up some resistance when we said to say like, hey, this is also frustrating me too. I've heard the, hey, you don't understand my situation type of response. So it, it, it's all dependent on your relationship and the flow of the conversation. Um, yeah, so I don't have a yes or no answer. I just sort of, just kind of as, as you're talking and feeling it out, you know, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll assess accordingly. But um, I think what, why have, did anyone try to open that one up? Why haven't you been logging into distance learning? If they're willing to kind of talking through their day to kind of understand, is there something that's physically preventing them from doing it? Or is it more just they're not wanting to engage in that way? Yeah, and just ask. I think that's great, Jennifer. Just saying, hey, what outside of school is getting in the way of this whole distance learning thing? That's a great question. And then the student will be able to lay out the blueprint of their life during shelter in place for you. And then you'll have as an educator, an accurate picture of what it looks like for them. And then with MI and with conversation, then you can focus. So you can say if a, if a young person says, yeah, you know, my mom's at work, I'm babysitting my, my uh, baby sister my niece is coming over and my aunt's at the house all the time and I don't like the way she's talking to me and then she's making me do chores and my mom doesn't make me do chores and I just want to play my and all of a sudden there's like seven things there you go right and then you can say like hey out of all those seven things what do you want to focus on first so when we do the evocative questions you're all you're sometimes you're doing them to just sort of help the young person with some life factors outside the con text and that'll that will tether the relationship and then that will help talk make talking about school easier so we're going to move on here we'll, we can come back to it what the heck that's not what we're, oh yeah backwards all right after so if anything today it's that an evocative question should lead you into an affirmation and we'll practice that in a second here affirmations show what i call as accurate empathy that's in the, the motivational interviewing world. It's different than sympathy. It shows that you're listening to a person's emotions. Um, they're simple. Below are a few examples of affirmations. And I try not to, you don't, you can do this. I try not to start affirmations with sounds like what I hear you saying or so. Sounds like and what I hear you saying, sometimes we learn that in like active listening classes. It sounds too, it sounds too therapeutic. It's almost like you're pathologizing a young kid. Kids in alt ed and in settings where they've had tons of interface with programmatic people, they can read right through that, right? They've been through that. It's less interpersonal. So just go straight to the source. It's more impactful. Um, so below are four affirmations that you can kind of utilize all the time when students are kind of going through a tough time and you're talking to them about it. And I want to... Um, 
you're in a tough spot. It's difficult to log into school every day. You're feeling annoyed with that class. Nobody understands what you're going through. Affirmation side with the young person's experience. We don't want to be overly affirmational because then we'll just jump off the bridge with somebody, right? We, but, but we want to, when we first begin our conversation, not try to be mechanical and fix where they're coming from. So this is a good start. And I'm going to put, oh, I can't let's see. How many. Oh, we'll just do it out loud. I got it. Um, so let's role play a little bit as a group and feel free to just jump in and say something. And I'll, I'm just going to, I'll pretend like I'm the kid. And then I'm going to make a statement. Okay. And I just want you to affirm it. And that's fine. And if you don't feel like doing it, you don't have to by any means. But if you come into the fray and do it, then that's great. I wrote down a couple. Uh, let's start with this. Um, you're talking about distance learning and you ask the question, hey, what's been the hardest thing since the shelter in place started or something? And so I'm the young person, which is a great open-ended question if you're a teacher. What's been the hardest thing with all this for you, right? And the, the kid says, and you can do that as a group with your class. Start off with an icebreaker that way. Um, not being able to see my friends has been the hardest part. So if I'm the student, I say, hey, not being able to see my friends has been the hardest part. What could you say to affirm that statement? It's difficult not seeing your friends. Perfect. <laughs> it, it's funny because that's sort of essentially exactly what I said. But yeah, yeah, it's it, the, the whole social thing is difficult. Yeah, just do that. Okay. That Anybody? Can be Go really ahead. Lonely. This can be really lonely. Excellent. This, this can be a really lonely time. Anyone else have a different version of that or should we go on to the next one? Let's go on. Okay. Now I can't even read my handwriting. Oh, okay. So as, as, here's another response to that question, right? As if this isn't hard enough, now my parents took away my PS4. A little bit trickier. And you can just say like, that must be really frustrating. Perfect, nice. Good. Any, uh, and that, th this is also, if, if you want to take a stab at a, at a reflection here, this is a really good chance to use a reflection. Affirmations are also reflections. Reflections are just more advanced affirmations. Anybody else have a different way to respond to that? Hey, as if this, is, as if this isn't hard enough, now I don't even have my PS4. It's, it's hard to lose things you love. Great. When you're already feeling challenged. Hey, hey, there you go. <laughs> I love equating love with the PS4 is totally spot on with this, with the, with our generation of students, huh? That's a, that's awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a double-sided reflection right there. Yeah. And trust me, if kids hear that, they're gonna feel like you're connecting with them, and then you're on your team, and then you can really work together. And it seems like a lot of you have the, the natural ability to do this stuff, which is great. So if you do anything in distance learning with your conversation, start with that evocative question and then affirm the response. And that will take your interactions to the next level, just if you do those two things. You're, a lot of you might be teachers or educators working in a classroom context. You're not gonna have time to do the whole conversational thing with the kids. But if you just do those two things, the connection will be established. Okay. So reflective listening. Reflective listening shows the speaker you are understanding them. It guides the conversation in a direction and it's non-judgmental. And it's something we can teach our students to do with each other. And it's something our students actually do pretty well if they're allowed to. A lot of the times up at Juvenile Hall, they're great reflective listeners when the kids start talking about their life experiences. They, they actually, they impress the adults with the way that they're able to respond, right? Um, yeah, you're just repeating the words back to them in a different way, but in a guiding style. So here's a bunch of different reflections. I have a, I have a document. Um, it's like a 69, 71, 70, something like that slide presentation that's interactive where you click on these and you'll hear my voice and they walk you through all the different steps of all these reflections. There's a link to it. If you want it, just email me. Um, here's all the different reflections that you can use, right? So are there a bunch of chat stuff coming up? I should probably look. I'll look in a second. You're all good. Okay, cool. Um, 
Yeah, so here's all the different reflections. We're going to go over one that's uh, commonly used and that's helpful. It's called agreement with a twist. This is sort of what differentiates an affirmation from a reflection. So if you can start incorporating this agreement with a twist in your interactions with kids, it'll be really, or parents, it'll be really helpful, right? This helps, this helps take the status quo of like, I can't do something um, and, and switch it towards thinking about doing it, right? So it's a reflection that affirms what the speaker is saying, but off, off, also offers a new meaning or direction. It helps move the conversation away from the status quo so a flow of the conversation can begin. So here's an example. The student or child said, it was just way easier to do my work at school. Now it's too easy to get distracted. How many of you have heard some sort of thing like that? Pretty, that's pretty common, right? Yeah. Okay. When this happens, we have a tendency to do what's called the writing reflex. We want to try to fix the person's problem. And that interferes with our ability to hear what's going on. We go right to, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Hey, have you done this? Have you just tried one hour one day and then just skipped a day and then gone to Wednesday? And we want to go right there, right? But that's not listening. So in this example, agreement with the twist works really well. The parent or the teacher can say, hey, these new changes get in the way for sure. And yet you felt better about yourself when you got your work done. So the affirmation is that the these new changes get in the way. These new changes are difficult. They throw us for a loop, right? But you felt better about yourself when you were completing your schoolwork. So the twist is that you take that statement and you move it in a direction where the variable of self-esteem is introduced. And when young kids can start talking about how it makes them feel, how, hey, I equate success with these positive emotions, then you're really moving in a direction. And then eventually you can say, hey, so from now until next Monday, what are some things that you can do to kind of get the ball rolling again, right? So the response, yeah, it made me feel like I earned it, you know, like I felt better about myself. So just with one reflection, now you're talking about change. And, it's, and if a student can voice, the, the fundamental hypothesis with MI is, if you can voice making a change, if you, your voice makes the change, you're more likely to make it. You know, so double-sided. Someone did, who was it that did the double-sided reflection a minute ago during the affirmation segment? Yeah. Vera. Yeah, that was awesome. So yeah, just do it. Was Vera, you said? Sierra, Sierra. I think it was me. Yeah, Sierra, just everyone, just do what Sierra did and well, you know, this whole distance learning thing will be easy. <laughs> Sarah, good job. You should just take over. I'll just check out and get another coffee or something. All right. Um, so here's an example. I gotta, we gotta move because I'm just doing my whole, like taking too much time thing. So, okay, communication traps. On the opposite end of reflections are the communication traps we fall in. So if you want this presentation, you wanna have fun with it, go ahead. Um, just send me an email, it's kind of fun. Um, the most common things we do as uh, parents, I'm a parent, uh, teachers, educators, is we, we give advice and then we, we try to lecture um, or maybe we ask too many short-ended short, short -ended questions that are just yes, no, right? So let's see. Here's an example of giving advice that I've heard uh, since the distance learning thing started. You know, you really should listen to your teachers when they tell you you have to start doing some of your work. That's a parent to a kid, right? Yeah, I know, I just don't feel like it. It's hard when you aren't there, you know. So that's a young person saying, actually, in this example, to their dad. I know, but you have all this time. Why don't you set up a schedule for yourself for the week? So the dad here is trying to help the young person figure things out, but he's missing out on the reflection piece, right? I've tried that before. That doesn't work for me. So when you do that, what, what you're doing is actually you're creating what's called counter motivation for the young person. Now the young kid just wants to move farther away from the help that's offered because it's unsolicited. So if that doesn't work, you're going to have to find something that does because Oh, I, don't, I forgot to complete that. But anyways, if you want to climb out of this trap, here's, the, here's a double-sided reflection. Okay, Sierra, I think this is double-sided. Or maybe it's a reframe. Yeah, I know, I can do better, but it's hard when you aren't there. It's a tough transition, and yet you have the abilities to succeed. So that's, that's a double-sided reflection. So because it says that it acknowledges the fact that the student says, I can do better, right? I guess I just need to give myself some time to start. Now the student is saying that as opposed to the parent. 
So student voices change, increased motivation, and yeah, you got some, some togetherness. Okay, let's do some stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll is, a, is what we can do when um, we're called into question when we feel challenged in the moment. We pause before we pounce, we're gonna drop our automatic responses, and we're gonna roll with resistance. How much time we got? Okay, 13 minutes. So let's spend about five minutes with this. So when someone says like, look, I'm sick of you calling me all the time. I just don't want to do school. When we hear something like that and we're trying to reach out to a student who has been unresponsive to distance learning and they just hit us with something that calls us into question, it can be difficult to provide a response. This muscle will help us get better at that. Before we say anything, we're gonna to try to listen to the resistance. And it's a metacognitive thing where we're actually gonna throw out our sort of automatic assumption. Let's see how we do this. Okay. So here's a couple examples that I wanna to talk to everybody. Um, here's one I've heard. Here's a student who uh, was sort of being lectured by their teacher. This talk is not really helping me right now and they told the teacher that. And then the teacher said, oh no, the, in this example, the teacher would drop. I'm just trying to help. If you listened, it would be different. So before they responded in their mind, they would throw that statement away. They would recognize that there's a theme that the student is saying. Hey, this talk isn't really helping me right now. What they're really saying is, hey, there's a lack of connection here. You're not understanding where I'm coming from. So when you're able to detect a theme in the midst of someone's discord or resistance, you're gonna be able to actually provide an accurate response. So I think I put something like, it'd be more helpful if I stopped making suggestions and just started by listening to where you're at. When we create resistance, it's okay to reflect on the fact that we're responsible for creating that because that will get us back on track with the relationship. So let's, um, let's go over a couple things real quick. Um, let me stop the share real quick here. Does anybody have a couple examples of challenging statements they've heard during distance learning? Or it could be just outside of distance learning where a student or a parent kind of called you into question, put you on the spot and made it hard for you to respond. And we'll go through the whole stop, drop and roll process. It's, it might be hard to kind of think of one. It could, you can even, I just can't look at screens all day. Carrie, are you saying that like to, to, to me to like mix this up and try to figure out a way to, or is that a student said that? Cause I, I was ready for it. I was like, all right, Carrie, right on. We'll, we'll just, we'll just do this in the moment, you know? No, 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 I'm talking about, that's what I'm hearing from students. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cause I was, I was, gonna, I, I was gonna have to drop like, hey, well you shouldn't have logged into this boot camp or something. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> all right. So students said, okay, so it was, I can't keep looking at screens all day. All right, so someone else, unmute yourself. What response would you drop instead of just using it? What assumption or what could you drop when that was said? This is the way that it is. <laughs> it is what it is, right? <laughs> it, is, okay, great. it is what it is. It's funny how our mind just goes right through that, right? Okay. So... Let's, we'll drop that. What's the, what's the theme behind the student's speech right there? I just can't keep looking at what's What's the underlying message in that very simple statement? They're feeling overwhelmed. Oh, beautiful. All right, Devin, nice. Maybe they're, and we sometimes we have to guess and sometimes we'll guess wrong, but there you go. Something to do with overwhelmed. Carrie, use, I miss school. Okay, so let's provide a, a reflection. Let's do the role then. So who wants to roll with, with, uh, with that statement? Devin, just say what you said in the form of a reflection. Um, just that like, you know, the, the learning that we're doing right now is really overwhelming. Great. This whole process is overwhelming for you. A lot of the times when you just roll that way, they'll start talking about what other things are overwhelming. And then you're all obviously, then you're all of a sudden having a conversation. And it might, when we do this, it might not be that they're actually legitimately sick of looking at screens. They might just need to kind of process through some other stuff to get back on track. Right. 
So that's the importance of the role. All right, who's got one more example and then we got to go to the group stuff. Because I only have 45 minutes, I thought I had an hour. All right. You mean a new one or, or roll, are we still rolling with? Yeah, whatever, whatever you're feeling. New one, you can do another roll. Does anybody have another example? That was a, that was a really good one, Carrie. Uh, I've gotten that they have trouble, like I'm having trouble keeping up with all the different courses or I'm having trouble keeping up with all the different assignments. Great. So let's, let's role play that one. What will we, what, what could we drop? What sort of uh, automatic response? Can you say that? Can you, Devin, can you be the student who says that? Just use the exact language? Or, or yeah, maybe. so I'm having trouble keeping up with all of the distance learning assignments. Well, are you showing up for study hall? <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm a study skills teacher, so solutions are always there. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's called the, it, and it, it, sometimes they work, right? Sometimes, yeah. it, sometimes it resonates. Let's plot our planner. <laughs> yeah, so great. Okay. So who can roll with that? Yeah, there there's are so a lot. many different, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to keep up with. That's really tough. Nice. All the different platforms cause all this new learning to happen and it's overwhelming. Great, good. Yeah, yeah. This stuff's way more work for um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes that works, Tim. Like uh, I think Cynthia, you kind of brought it up earlier. Hey, this, is a, this presents a challenge for all of us and we're trying to figure it all out, right? Yeah, good. And that's a good time Some, to do what's, here's another acronym, and I'm not into acronyms, but uh, this is just what it is. It's called EOE. It's called Elicit, Offer, Explore. Um, it's a great way to not provide advice, and it's a really good way to respond to young people who are always looking to adults for advice. How many people have students who are maybe have a good relationship with, and they ask you to solve their problem for them, like saying, hey, I don't know how to get a job right now. All the time. <laughs> Hey, I don't know how to do this. I don't, hey, do you know how to do Have you done this before? Like, and then we want to tell them, right? That's never true that the student doesn't know that, which is funny. They, they speak in generality sometimes. So instead of telling them like, oh yeah, have you done a resume? Have you done this? Did you, did you go there? Did you look who's hiring? Did you get an application? Start by saying, hey, I have some ideas of how I could help, but I'm curious about what you do know first. And then the student will tell you everything that, that they know. And most of the time, they actually sort of know how to do what they said they don't know how to do. So that's elicit, offer, explore. Mm -hmm. So before you offer your suggestion, you elicit what they already know. And then once you get there, you'll explore it together. That's another way of kind of being on the same playing field. All right. I got to share screen again, I think. So it's EOE, simple conversational thing. When you're asked advice or when you're asked to be the expert, do that first. Oh no, don't tell me now I can't. Oh, all right. Oh, let's see, we got, oh, five minutes. I gotta do this. Gosh, this 45 minutes stuff. Restorative circles. Um, when we do circles in class, uh, some of you may have may, may be doing circles, have some experience with them. We can't really do them from a distance, but there's elements of a restorative circle that we can incorporate into distance learning. So in person, we're able to actually use the talking piece, to decide if it's gonna go around sequentially or non-sequentially, or if we're gonna pass it or do whatever we're gonna do. From a distance, we're not gonna have a talking piece that we can pass around unless you get creative, maybe you can. So our circles are gonna be activity driven. Some of the stuff we've talked about, about conversations that students can have about their challenges, they can have a group experience about what's been the hardest thing and do a problem solving thing together while you sort of facilitate um, it can still involve item sharing. So a lot of the times in circle, we have a centerpiece where we put our items into. So if you want from a distance to have kind of a social emotional group, have a student bring an item to Zoom that carries some weight in their life or is meaningful, right? So whether it's a keychain, I don't think anyone has those anymore or uh, whatever it is, right? Some sort of element of, uh, or piece of jewelry or whatever, right? 
and have them talk about that over Zoom and sh share why that's important to them. And then utilize breakout groups for your kind of makeshift circles. So those are some ways to kind of do the whole circle thing from a distance. Still keep the whole centerpiece item sharing thing in. And then here's a couple things. This is all in the uh, that uh, detailed schedule. You can you have access to all these documents. So just click on the link if you actually want this. This is super fun. The kids love this. Um, they all they want to play. They, it's screwed up everything I try to do on a weekly basis because they sort of just want to do this kind of stuff. So I'm like, all right. Um, this is SEL Bingo. You can change this however you want. This is just a template where you're the facilitator and you say, hey you know, get, get, get a couple pennies out or some quarters or a pen and just circle them or X them out or whatever. And then you'll just read the prompts. You know, I enjoy cooking. So you'll read that out loud. If a student enjoys cooking, they'll square that up. Um, I bought something for myself that I've wanted for a long time. And then you can say like, hey, within the last week or within the last month or within the last couple months, you know, I received a compliment or some kind words for someone. But in order for them to win, right, in order for them to actually get a vertical or horizontal bingo, they have to elaborate on all their choices. So if a student says bingo, then you have to pause and you have to say, okay, if you want the prize, whatever that is, you have to tell me what music you listen to or, hey, when you got upset or angry with someone who lost your cool, what happened, right? This is also a great template to get us in the habit of asking open-ended questions because as the teacher, we'll be asking them to elaborate on some of their responses during bingo. So this is fun. This one's called the card game. I made this up in the parking lot when I had nothing to do about 10 minutes before class, which is sort of how I like to do things, um, which isn't good. And it's just sort of been what's what's been happening in, in my life thus far, procrastination and then, you know, doubling back and trying to make it better. But um, here's the card game. All of the prompts here correspond to a card. So if, it's, if they have a deck of cards or if you need someone to run some deck of cards over to a kid's house and you set up, set up an activity, this can last all class. Um, it's the same kind of idea if you, know, you draw a six of spades, the best memory with my friends is. And then the next kid will go, um, when I no notice another person is having a hard time, I do blank if you have a jack of hearts. And all of a sudden, you're really learning about a young person's life in a very kind of secure way, instead of asking them direct personal questions, the card does the work for you and then the conversation begins. So this one's kind of fun. And then lastly, I think, oh, we got one minute, okay. Oh, we don't need that, let's just end. We'll do that another time. All right, so that was a lot in 45 minutes. Uh, sorry for for make it, for doing that, but um, any, uh, any thoughts, feedback, questions, stuff we want to talk about, that was kind of like a, 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 a really power, like a fast in service there. I just want to say I, during our seventh grade orientation, we did like a show and tell where they described something that was important to them for in some way that they wanted to share. And it was so fun. And they like, they, I was surprised because I thought they were going to be like, Oh, I have to go get a thing. And they like seemed to have a really good time with it. So like simp like, I, cause I work with seventh graders and I like, forget sometimes that they're still kids and they like show and tell like a bunch of them like brought their pets and like they like had these really meaningful things to say about it and it was really fun so like yeah no it's it's little things like that it's yeah. funny like we do this uh, game at juvenile hall where they have to write down their their top three favorite animals but they can't show anybody what they're in and then everyone has to guess and you get points if you guess them right and it's the funniest game and that works for like my my three-year-old plays that game right so like that's like a universal game and it just creates so much laughter because you because it kind of it brings into this the stereotype typing element too and there's you know kids have different animals that they like and people are giving them a hard time and it's like this friendly <laughs> heckle fest and little things like that create the conditions for engagement and that's the most important thing when we're trying to learn on a computer right we want to make sure there's some buy-in so we could do that conversationally or in those kind of group exercises any other thoughts um I was just going to throw out another idea. I'm a speech and language pathologist, so I have small groups and I see my kids all the time. Yeah. I Zoom a lot, um, but I have a lesson plan of fake news and I start it with two truths and a lie. Love and it. it's a really, really nice way to get to know the kids. Yeah, I, we do that too, Cynthia. And, and I make the, the group guess the lie. Right. 
Exactly. And, and they get a point yep. if they guess it, you know, totally. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts or I'm, oh, we got other people coming on. Am I supposed to start the other group? Uh, the other one starts in 10 minutes, but I was just going to oh, say, you. I went, Gabriel, I just, man, you can hang out with me. You, you know more about this than I do. All right. Uh, well, no, I was just going to the detailed schedule and there's a link there that says the card game. And when I click on it, it says access denied. So that's all that's there. So hmm. just for the people who are looking for this, because yeah, I thought your presentation was cool and I would love to look at some more of it. Okay. Dude, I have mm -hmm. access yeah. to Let the slideshow. Oh. How but I did, the other things are access denied. But then, if you request access through Google, it should send Julius a, like a message. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Just request it, and then I'll just confirm that you can have it, and then I'll try to fix that. Um, you mean request it through you or request it through the boot? Camp? Oh, now it the, was yeah, on the schedule, like the boot camp schedule that was like the detailed session descriptions. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in is. that matrix, okay. Julius has a bunch of links listed, and if you I, click that, then you can request through there. I, I see it now. I had I had opened the link yesterday, and there was less stuff. And now, if you open it now, there's more stuff. Right. Yeah, because I I did the whole procrastination thing. Like <laughs> I did that like two minutes before I logged on. Yeah. And thank hence, you, Julius. Hence, that was a really functional. Thank you. I just wanted to say it was a very functional um, yeah. presentation. Amazing. Cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So just do the do the open end question, affirm it, and then do the stop. Just think about stop, drop, and roll when you're called into question. Have some fun with the conversational stuff. I'm gonna practice that with my girlfriend. So uh, just stop, <laughs> stop, drop, and roll. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hard. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard with the emotional thing, like with my wife and stuff. I'm. You know. It's just. Are you on fire, Tim? <laughs> Uh, I might be, depending on what I say. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll see you guys in another room. Thank you so much. Thank Julie. you so much. See you guys. All right.